The Hudson River, it has a fascinating history. Wars, they've been fought there. Fortunes, they've been made. Natural beauty, it can be found. A new book, it details all of that over the past century and a half. It is called The History of the Hudson River Valley from the Civil War to Modern Times. And I sat down with its author, Vernon Benjamin. Vernon, thank you very much. Uh, talk about an undertaking, trying to do the entire uh, history of the Hudson River and, and the Valley. Uh, this the second volume for folks who are unfamiliar with the first one. Give us an idea where that took us and where this picks up. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. It's, it's, it's uh, really an honor. Um, the first problem, the first volume brings the history from wilderness to the Civil War. And by wilderness, I mean I went back to the geological history and brought it right up through the paleontology and the early Aborigines and Native Americans and um, really up to the end of the Civil War. The book ends with Abraham Lincoln's funeral train coming up through the valley. Um, and the second volume takes it from, from there to modern times, roughly 2000, although I I go past 9-11 uh, and uh, talk a bit also about Andrew Cuomo mm -hmm. and some of the things that are going on in the state. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to sure. cut it off at a particular year. Well, let's pick it up in the, in the late 1800s and, and even beginnings of the 20th century. So much of the valley defined by some of the huge outside names and families, um, whether they will get to the, the Roosevelt, certainly, but even uh, the Vanderbilts and certainly the Rockefellers. Um, and their fingerprints over so much of the Hudson Valley. And that's true throughout the whole history. Um, and of course it's related to its proximity to the metropolitan area and to the greatest harbor in, in the world. Um, and when the Europeans came, uh, they established a great commercial center here. And that drew uh, some, some of those names, uh, beginning with the Rensselaers and the Livingstons in the early period. And, uh, uh, coming, as you said, uh, right up through the 20th century. Um, Vanderbilt, um, uh, Rockefellers, and uh, uh, John Burroughs is a special hero of mine. Uh, but uh, these are American icons in, in many ways. And uh, the Rockefeller family in particular in, in Westchester County, but because of Nelson, all over the place uh, had, a, had a great impact. I think Nelson Rockefeller was a fairly decent governor. I, I think I give him more credit than, than many do. Um, I should have probably asked this, and I'm doing this in reverse order, but the Hudson River or the Hudson Valley means different things to different people. I'm sure even people viewing right now right. may not realize they're part of it um, while others fully embrace it. Give an idea geographically, and obviously the river is the touchstone that connects so much of it, mm -hmm. but where does it start and where does it end? Right, the river is like a great spine that holds the tributaries and the, and the, and the ribs of the valley together. Um, and the Today, I define the valley as basically from the city of Yonkers just past Glens Falls, uh, north and south. And on either side, the, the bowl of the Catskill Mountains uh, or near Ramapos and uh, the Berkshires and Green Mountains. And, but in prehistory or in other times in history, it really depends on what's going on. During the geological period, the valley went way past what, where the Verrazano Narrows is now, 120 miles out to the continental shelf. And there are traces of mastodons and other animals that, that were out in that area. And uh, it was very difficult for me to leave New York City mm -hmm. when I was first writing. And I thought, boy, I, I can leave New York when George Washington does in 1783, when, you know, when he leaves it in the hands of George Clinton and the new New York state government. But then um, I'm, I'm working on other stuff later on. And here's Edgar Allan Poe, uh, six miles from the city working on the Raven. And where is he working on it? Well, roughly where the United Nations is today. <laughs> so it was very difficult to get out of the city. And of course, he lived uh, in the 1848-49 uh, in, in uh, Fordham, which is in the Bronx sure. today. Few people would equate the Bronx with the Hudson River Valley. And I do move away from there. But there is so much that are still the connecting sinews that tie us together with the metropolitan area. One of those has to do with the wealthy people who came up river because this was their, not just their recreation, but uh, their, their uh, outlets to, to the busy busyness and 
the problems of the metropolitan area. And so much of the preservation kind of connects to that, too, from the Rockefeller and all the estates that we've seen here uh, that have been left behind. But in terms of political giants, I think it, it starts in many ways, of course, with the Roosevelts, and not just FDR, but Teddy Roosevelt as mm -hmm. well, and really not so much the formation of the New York State government, but really moving it along. Um, and uh, the impatience uh, defines certainly Teddy, as you get in the book, but even FDR, he, he made his bones um, going after uh, a nominee who we felt was corrupt. He was in the state senate at the time, and then that created an international platform for him that obviously went to Albany and then eventually to D.C., but um, so much of that was really born in the valley. That was a marvelous moment, yes. And, but Teddy Roosevelt came up upriver first as an assemblyman, and uh, he expected to stay just one year, uh, but he got caught up in it and was pretty good at it. Very unusual person, extremely unusual. The wags uh, who were part of the press corps at the time looked him over and one of them said, he's all teeth. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was like that. He was just this ebullient personality. A small man, but very strong. And uh, some of the bad guys in Albany tried to pick on him, but he knocked them right down. Uh, and uh, he, of course, you know, his history is, is amazing, how he became president and, and how he was still deeply connected with the Valley during his presidency. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, 1911, as, as you, what you were talking about, when his first year in the New York State Senate, he, uh, it was unbelievable that he beat this fellow Lou Payne, who was a part of the old guard Republican uh, 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 world at the time. And he comes up there, and they, those same political wags l look at him, and they think, oh, he's a, he's a blue blood. He's, he wears his pince nez uh, on his nose and makes him look like he's looking down at everybody. But he took a stand against Tammany Hall over the appointment of a new U.S. senator. At that time, senators weren't elected. They were appointed by the state legislature. And Chauncey Depew, who was this marvelous figure, um, was stepping down. and. Uh, a uh, replacement was needed, and uh, Tammany Hall wanted uh, blue-eyed Billy Sheehan, a uh, scoundrel from, from Buffalo who uh, um, also uh, worked in the Valley. He was a partner of Alton Parker, who was a presidential candidate at one point. Um, and Roosevelt couldn't brook the fellow. And uh, uh, there's the, the, the chapter, the section where I deal with it is this marvelous moment when the uh, Albany fire, this fire occurs in the Albany capital and completely destroys the library and, and, and the western side of the capital. And that was on the very night when the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem had decided that they were going to make a decision about having a vote on Billy Sheehan. Uh, and it was actually one of their people working late in the library who probably left a cigar laying around, and that started the fire. So that decision was postponed, but three weeks later, Tammany Hall threw up their hands and said, hmm. we can't beat this guy. Yeah. Roosevelt led a small insurgency of Senate Democrats who would not go along with the party on it, and they wound up um, compromising on Martin Glynn, who was a Tammany Hall guy, and, but was more moderate. And coming back on the other side of the break, more of our conversation where we'll get into some of the destination spots in the Valley that have come to define it and how they've changed over the years, like West Point. Stay tuned for part two of our conversation with author Vernon Benjamin.